Good morning. Mute that real quick. It's good to see you all here this morning. We all survived. Is that? I don't know. Uh, I think we all survived the. What is that? Handheld. Is it not muted? Okay, can you hear me? All right, we're having technical difficulties. That was weird. Um, hey, if you have a worship folder, we have just a few announcements to look at this morning. My glasses are somewhere, so I don't know. Um, the first thing, uh, WOM is having a meeting on seven, uh, the 7th, which is tomorrow. And then we have a called business meeting Next Sunday, following the AM service, it will be here at the church, uh, and we are voting to officially make Carl our interim music minister and... This one? This one on. And we have to set his housing allowance. So those are the only two things we're voting on in the business meeting is to officially... Uh, make him interim and to vote on his housing allowance. So uh, that should be a very brief business meeting after worship next Sunday. Uh, children's choir is still going on, so kids three and up are welcome to attend that on Sunday evenings. Uh, I'm going to skip the next one if you're looking at the worship folder. Uh, children's camp is coming up, so there's a parent meeting February 20th to give information about the kids' camp. We're going to a different camp this year. We're going to uh, Camp Copus in Denton. Should be fun. And then VBS is coming up, so prepare for that if you are interested and you weren't able to come to the meeting last week. See my wife, and she will get you plugged in for uh, VBS. And then um, we're still taking care package stuff for the uh, college students over there. So uh, see the list of items you can bring. That's not an exhaustive list. You can bring other things as your imagination just runs wild. Uh, and not on here, um, something we have in the works that we have not really announced, I don't think I've announced it at all, is uh, National Day of Prayer is May 5th. Um, normally our church has not done anything, not really got involved with National Day of Prayer, and we're not really getting involved with the official organization, but we are going to participate in the National Day of Prayer this year. What we are doing is I have contacted or we have attempted to contact six other churches. If you start at 121 on Precinct Line Road, go all the way up to Davis, there are seven churches who have addresses on Precinct Line Road. These are churches of various uh, denominations, various worship styles, various sizes, and we've attempted to contact these churches, and we want to have a group not really group because we do it at our individual churches, but a drive-through prayer event on the National Day of Prayer, May 5th. What this would consist of, and let me just tell you at our church, what it would consist of is having volunteers to be at the church most of the day. And when I say most of the day, it doesn't mean you as a volunteer would have to be here all day. You could sign up for two hours, four hours, or you could be here all day. And we would have cars drive in the parking lot, go around the building, and basically they would stop out here. We'd come up to the car, and depending on their comfort level, you can hold their hand and pray with them, or you can stand six feet away and pray with them, but you would pray with them about any prayer needs they have. And that's it. And we will have stations over here in the front parking for evangelism, so if someone needs to talk more, pray more in depth, we they would we'd ask them to pull to the side, and we would have several people over there who uh, would feel comfortable sharing the gospel and praying more in depth with folks. And uh, we would hand them a gospel track, some literature about the church. Uh, if they feel comfortable giving us contact information, we could follow up and pray with them some more. And that's it. So we're asking these various churches to join with us in this, and. It's a show, a show of unity among the body of Christ because there's such a division in our country, in our world right now. We're divided along political lines, 
who we want to win the Super Bowl, who we want to go to the Super Bowl. I mean, you name it, there's something to divide us. Even the church is being divided, and we want to have this event to show that the church can, whether we worship contemporary, traditional, whether we have Anglican in our name, or Baptist, or community church, or whatever it is, that we can come together as a body of Christ and unite in prayer. So Tuesday, we had these churches meet here at the church, at our church, and four of the six, four of the seven churches, five of the seven churches, is that right? Uh, five of the seven churches met together, and we prayed together, we started organizing this event, and these other churches, let me tell you, they're excited. If you go down towards Walmart, there's a church called uh, Salt and Light Church, or Light and Salt Church, and it's a predominantly Korean church, and they, were, they had a representative here. Um, if you drive north, you'll see Consumed Church, which is more of a Pentecostal persuasion, they had a representative here. Um, Bear Valley, which is a Southern Baptist church, but has Bear Valley community in their name. Uh, they were here, and Bo, help me out. Who else was here? There was, was it one more? Or is that it? There was one more. Who was it? Uh, da, 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 da. Anyway, so all these churches sent representatives. We got together. And we uh, prayed, we planned, and we're going to meet together some more. So I'm asking you as a church to pray about how God would have you be involved. If you can be here up here part of the day to volunteer and pray with people or all day, and then afterwards we're going to try to meet at the Tarrant County Sub Courthouse on 26th, all the churches together and have a time of prayer and singing and uh, maybe a, a brief inspirational message. Um, just to get these churches and our community together to pray. That's it. It's about prayer. It's about God uniting his people together through prayer. So you're going to find out more about this as we plan, as we get more details. But I want you to be uh, in prayer about this uh, because it's something that can impact this community for Christ. And that's why we're here, to see people come to know Jesus. Anyway, so I think that's all my announcements for now. So uh, Carl is going to come lead us in worship and pray that his microphone works. Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, let's begin with a note of praise. Number 56, we're going to look at the chorus first. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Stand if you can. We'll sing it together. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. And again, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Thank you, sir. Pray with me. Our gracious God, we are grateful to be able to come together as a body, as a bride of Christ, and worship you through song, to be able to fellowship together, to open your word and allow your spirit to speak to our hearts through that inspired word. And God, I pray today that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified, that the name of Jesus would be exalted in this place. God, I pray that you touch our hearts. Help us to know that we're in your presence. God, if the Holy Spirit is filling each believer in here, then the Holy Spirit is powerful in this place, and we believe that to be so. God, as we continue singing, as your word is read, as your word is preached, touch our hearts. Help us to leave here 
closer to you better than what we came in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we began with a praise because God, God inhabits the praise of his people. But as Clay has often shared with us, the hymns tell great stories. Great hymns tell great stories. And that's true of number 56, to God be the glory. So this time, let's go back and let's sing the verses as well and pay attention to the great things God has done. The 
that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears. And it dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It will never lose. It will never lose. It will never lose. It's power. morning. The scripture reading this morning is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 46. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Please be seated. I don't know what's going on with our sound today. but Hey, do we have any kids in here? Hey guys. Owen, oh, what is that around your neck? Binoculars? Oh, okay. Very cool. Are you guys scared of the dark? Yeah? You used to be? Oh. So I. Uh, I work for a phone company, which is probably the most exciting job in the history of jobs. And uh, I used to be an outside technician, a cable splicer, right? That means I take a telephone cable and a ca telephone cable and I put them together. They could train a monkey to do what I did. Um, no comments? Okay. Um, but one of the things we had to do is go in manholes. You know what a manhole is? Out in the street, right? Yeah. Well, there's no usually no sewage in our manholes. It's just usually a big concrete box in the ground. And uh, sometimes I would have to work in these manholes at night. And we would have this a generator producing electricity and I'd have a, a light in there with me. So occasionally you'd be down there working and your generator that's giving you electricity down there is run off of propane and your propane bottle would run out. And then the light would go out and you're in the middle of a manhole in the dark. And you know what you can see in the manhole in the dark? Nothing. It, it's, it's really dark. And suddenly, this manhole that you've been in for hours, and you know there's nothing in it, becomes very scary. Because I've seen crazy things in there. There's snakes and frogs. I've seen catfish in manholes. Yeah. Yeah, snakes. Um, do you say cats? You say cats? No, I've never seen a cat in there, thank goodness. Yes, I've seen poisonous snakes in there. Um, yeah. So you'd be in the manhole, the light would go out, and now you're trying to figure out how to get out because I, I didn't have a smartphone at the time. You know, you could use a flashlight on your phone. And so I just 
didn't have a light, and you just had to find your way out. But suddenly it's dark, and you don't know what's in there. And you're like, I wish I had light. This is really scary. And then sometimes I would sit there, and g- generally when you're in a manhole, you have a headset on. You're talking through the phone line to somebody else. And I say, hey, man, can you come, like, maybe turn my generator back on? But anyway, it's not that I was scared of the dark. It's the scared, afraid of not knowing what else is in the dark with me, right? That's what you're scared of. In, in Psalms chapter 27, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom, of whom should I be afraid? And a lot of times when we know what's out there, we're not really scared of it because we know God protects us. But sometimes we're scared of the unknown, right? What's in the dark? But God's our light, and we shouldn't be afraid of what's out there because he's going to take care of us, and he's the one that we put our hope, our trust our, our security in. So guys, sometimes in life you're uncertain about things, right? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen in a certain situation. But you know what? God's got your back. So put your hope, your faith, your trust in Him. So before y'all leave, don't, don't leave yet. Um, y'all know what month it is? You know what month it is? February. February. And what... Besides Valentine's Day and my birthday and Nick's birthday, what do we celebrate in, in, in February? Valentine's Day. No, I said Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Oh. The whole, no, no, the whole month long, what do we celebrate? What month is it? Oh, Hallmark month? Yes, Hallmark month. Everyone has to go home and watch Hallmark <laughs> Channel. N- no, it's Black, Black History Month. Oh, yeah. Yes. And let me tell you, at Shady Grove, for the past few years, we have recognized Black History Month. And what we do here is we recognize a significant figure, a black person who has, uh, African-American person who has made a significant contribution to church history, I'll say. Usually a pastor, a missionary, someone like that. Um, So, Georgia, change my slide for me. There you go. Today we're talking about Dr. S.M. Lockridge. He was born March 7th, 1913, April, and died April 4th, 2000. Now this guy, he's a good Texan. He was born in Texas, raised in Texas, but then he pastored a church for about 40 to 50 years in California um, and is a, a widely known orator. The guy is a phenomenal preacher. And Did you do the math? Then he died when he was 87. I didn't do the math. But he was an incredible man, man of God, and he's, we're going to listen to about six minutes of one of his sermons. Who's down for that? B- look at Bo. Bo knows what I'm doing. Bo knows this sermon. This is a very, very, fa- Dr. Burton, do you know this sermon? You know it too. It's, it's an incredible, six minutes, it's, it's about 13 minute long sermon, but we're only going to do six minutes, okay? And there's a little video thing somebody put together to go with it. So George, you go to the next slide. Oh, by the way, his first name is Shadrach. His middle name, Meshach. Seriously, Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. That's his name. So, George, go ahead and play this for us. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He's 
hypnotizes and he saves. He threatens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. That's the S.M. Lockridge, uh, incredible man. Uh, he traveled across the country, around the world, preaching the gospel. That's the gospel right there. And hundreds, thousands of people heard the gospel, came to Christ through this man's ministry. Uh, notable figure in church history. So, um, thank you for that. Um, you guys, follow Miss Jeanette. She's going to take you to Children's Church. Carl. Well, you know the trials that David had, and yet we read in Psalm 40 that he's lifted me up out of the miry clay and set my feet upon my rock and established my goings. He's put a new song in my heart, even praise unto my God. I think, I think that David would have liked this song. 746, he keeps me singing. Would you stand, please? There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all of life's ebb and flow Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my every long singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. My every longing keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wings. Always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing Keeps me singing as I go Though sometimes he leads through waters deep Trials fall across the way Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep 
see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome Far beyond the starry sky, I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I. So as someone said, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. 779, an old time favorite. Hasn't been sung for a while, but I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home. On God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning, some hallelujah by and by. I'll fly away when the shadows of this life have gone. I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars has flown. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, bye and bye. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy will never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah. Please be seated. And when you come to that time, and you'll see in your worship folder, if you're not familiar with our services and our order of service, you'll see it says uh, individual prayer or prayer time. And it's simply a time that we pray. And you're welcome to sit, stand, kneel where you are, or come to this old-fashioned altar and kneel here. And it doesn't matter your outward appearance, as long as you humble your heart before our almighty King. Go before His throne and Tell him you love him, worship him, and intercede on behalf of someone today. Whether it's a person sitting in front of you, behind you, next to you, someone you know that's not here this morning that desperately needs your prayer, lift them to the Father this morning. And don't forget to pray for yourself because we need it. So let's go to the Father for just a moment and let's pray.
Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the love you have for us, for the blood that was shed for us, for Jesus. God, we're grateful for your Holy Spirit that indwells us and renews us. And God, this morning, may everything we do here exalt you. And this morning, there are family that are here today or family who can't be here for various reasons who desperately need your touch, your hand, your moving in their lives. God, whether it's broken hearts, hurt, broken bodies, they're struggling. And God, I pray for them and lift them to your name, that you would touch their hearts, their souls, their bodies, and provide the healing that only you can. God, we pray for our nation, that, that your church would stand up, that we would see revival, that we would see multitudes coming to know Christ but you, because your church is faithful. And God, help us, as Shady Grove, this small body here on this hill to be the light that you've called us to be. May your spirit touch us, convict us, of our need to share the gospel that we so readily accepted with to a world that maybe has never heard. God, help us to be your messengers. Father, as Randy comes to sing and minister to us, may you bless him. May you, Spirit, continue to move in this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm, and on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Fought with the precious blood of Christ. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, light of the world in darkness slain, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the love of with the precious blood of God. of the world I darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day 
up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, says, has as curses grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, but with the precious blood of the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, and as he stands in victory, since worse has lost his grip on me, for Thank you, Randy. Uh, if I don't write things down, I will forget it immediately. Um, so I believe Lynn asked me to announce a deacon's meeting immediately after church, I think in adult one class. So if you're a deacon, adult one class immediately after church. I forgot. Uh, also, um, these beautiful flowers are donated by Brother Robert. Um, we had uh, Sandy's memorial this week. Uh, and... Uh, he won, there's a card on the welcome desk for you to read. He uh, expresses his heartfelt thanks for your love and support during this time. And uh, do continue to lift him up to the Father. Uh, but he donated these beautiful flowers this morning. So y'all are probably thinking, there's something different about the stage this morning. It's the flowers. Um, so, that, that's it, just the flowers. We're starting a sermon series. George, you go to my next slide this morning and the sermon series is called love goals now i, I think i might mention that uh, i had named it that and then what i generally do is when i try to come up with a, a, like a fix picture a logo or something for my sermon series i go online and i type in the name of my sermon series and see if there's something i could borrow that already has that name well love goals is a uh a, a tv show that's like uh one of these reality dating shows or something. I don't know if they're married or whatever. Anyway, it looks absolutely horrible. 
but I had already named my sermon series. So um, if you've ever seen the show, don't tell me because it looks terrible. I haven't, I've not watched it. I don't even know what channel or where it comes on. But anyway, so Love Goals is the name of our sermon series for the month of February. And if you see in the sermon, in the, in the worship folder, our four sermons, they start with looking for love, finding love, all the way through a legacy of love. And it's finding love and then um, growing love and then enduring love and then legacy of love and this what this is is through that marriage relationship your love should continually grow for your spouse to the point that you're able to pass that love the knowledge the what the wisdom you've gained on to your children and grandchildren hopefully to help them have successful marriage relationships now our sermon today is finding love and some of you are thinking uh well i found it no need for me to be here. Well, listen, if you have been in a marriage relationship for a long time and you're like, I, I know how this works, you may have someone in your life, a child, a grandchild, someone who at some point is going to be looking for that r marriage relationship, that love, and what you learn today, you could probably pass on some of this incredible wisdom you're going to find to them. Now, I was talking to a couple of people this morning, uh, Diana, and I was like, you know, I, I've, she's been married 48 years, 48 years, so she and Carl successfully married for 48 years, so I would say they're experts at marriage, and Jeanette and I are, have been married for 24 and a half years successfully, I would say we have a very, very happy marriage, so I would consider myself an expert at marriage, so this month you're getting expert at marriage, marriage advice from the best source possible. God's word, and from someone who's been doing it successfully for four, 23 years. Um, there's that one year that I, I didn't do so good. Uh, Jeanette's been great the whole time. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, that first year, trying to learn to communicate together, and uh, that poor woman having to deal with me. Uh, anyway, so today we're talking about finding love, and... I hope you can take notes this morning. Oh, look, there it is. You, you, some of you may not be familiar with all the dating site websites and apps and everything out there. There are probably a million of them. There's, I, I don't even know, there's Match, there's Single Mingle or Christian Mingle or something. Anyway, there's a million different websites where you can try and find dates or there's apps on your phone where you have to swipe right or left. I'm not sure exactly how it works because, thank God, I got married and found love before all that came to be. Um, I cannot imagine trying to navigate all that. Uh, anyway, I was going to tell you a funny story, but sometimes these things pop in my mind and I have to rebuke these thoughts. Um, so I'm rebuking this thought. It's not a bad thought. It's just a story y'all don't want to hear. Um, so... We're talking about finding love, and as a believer, and this primarily applies to believers, um, where do you find love? So we're going to look in Genesis, and you are thinking, in Genesis, things were a little bit different back then, but there's biblical truths that apply thousands of years ago and then apply today. And so we're going to take some biblical truths and apply them to finding this relationship, this lasting love, marital relationship, because I'm one who believes that Look, we, I understand we live in a fallen world and things happen. I understand that. Uh, and then you absolutely cannot control your spouse as much as you wish you could. Things happen, right? And as long as we live in this fallen world, divorce is going to happen, separation is going to happen, bad things happen. But today's sermon is about finding that love relationship and that will hopefully be God-honoring and will last a lifetime. And we're looking at Genesis, and we're going to be in chapter 24. Uh, we're looking at Isaac and Rebecca. And this is almost basically, not almost, this is an arranged marriage. And I tell my kids that I totally want to arrange their marriages. Anybody with me? I know, yeah. Um, I think I did a pretty good job picking out my wife. People question her judgment. Um, I, I keep saying I'm going to start one of these apps or websites, and it's going to be called arrangedmarriage.com. And you go on and you put a profile for your child 
and then you match them with someone. You with me? Y'all like this idea? I know the young people are like, no. And I tell you what, if I had relied on my parents to find my spouse, Lord help me. My goodness, that would have been something. Uh, anyway, um, rebuke, rebuke. Okay. Four, five, <laughs> five Ps here in this finding love. You write those five Ps down because you're going to fill this in. The first thing I want you to see is when you're looking for love, trying to find that significant other, that spouse that you want to be married to and love for a lifetime, you need to have right priority. That's your first point here, is the right priority. Because so many times people don't, they just, they're like, I just don't want to be alone. And you will settle for someone who is not the right person, not, I'm not even saying the best person, not even the right person for you, simply so you don't have to be alone. That's not a right priority. Don't get married, don't settle for someone in a relationship simply so you, so you don't have to be alone. I promise you, being alone is probably infinitely better than being married to the wrong person. Can God make it work out? Yes. But in that beginning, when you have that choice to pick this person, have a right priority. Look, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we see that God created man and woman. Chapter 1, verse 27, it says, So God created in his own, man in his own image. He created him in the image of God, and he created them male and female. God created man and woman to go together. That's the way this works, okay? I'm not getting into politics and stuff right now, but I'm just saying that God made man and woman to go together. And this is just an overview of creation, chapter 1. God gets more specific in chapter 2 about the creation of man and woman. So go to chapter 2. I believe it's verse 20, no, 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper for his complement. We're going to read all the way down to verse 24. Start, I think, 23. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal, every bird of the sky, and, and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever he, the man called the living creature, that is its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and every wild be animal. But the man had no. But but for the man, no helper was found as his complement. Verse twenty one. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib uh, made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And he, the man said, "This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman." For she was taken from man. This is why man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and becomes one flesh. So I want you to see this. God's design and purpose for man and woman is to be one flesh, to unite in marriage. God's purpose and design for us is to complement one another. He had Adam and he said, look, everything in, in, in the garden was good. He said, look, you created the stars and the sky and the earth and all the plants and the animals. And God said, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he, gets, he creates Adam. Adam's good, but he said, it's not good that Adam is alone. Let's create a, depending on the translation you have, a helper, a complement, uh, someone to complete him. That's what Eve did. They go together, and God said, and they will be bonded together and be one flesh. That's what happens in the marriage relationship, is that the husband and wife complete and complement each other. And so God's design and purpose is this, that you as a husband and wife come together as one flesh. So that right priority is this, that you are fulfilling God's design and purpose for you. Now listen, there's an attack on traditional biblical marriage in our world today. You, you may not believe that, but there is absolutely a coordinated attack, I believe, by Satan on traditional biblical marriage. If you watch the news, if you look in our world, you will know this is true. If you watch TV and see sitcoms and how marriage is just ridiculed there, if you, and this is not a sermon about pop, pop culture, but I'm trying to say that God's design is, is for the marriage relationship. That's what he designed us for. That's his purpose. We have in the church people using phrases like the gift of singleness. I have yet to find the gift of singleness in my Bible. This is an attack on traditional biblical marriage. People are like, you know what, I just have the gift of singleness. No, you're just honoring. I'm kidding. It, it's not a gift. 
It, it's not a thing. It's not in Scripture. It's just something that people are using to help tear up the family, the, tr- the, the, the foundation of society. And when Satan can break apart families and, and marriages, then he's attacking the church also. He's trying to destroy the church through this. The foundation of society is the family. And if Satan can destroy that, he he thinks he can destroy the church. Good luck trying. It's not going to happen. Because we know scripture teaches that the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church, his bride. The marriage relationship is a picture of the gospel itself. Paul refers to, the scripture refers to the Jesus as the groom and the church as the bride. So you have this picture of that gospel relationship, the relationship between God and his church, the picture of that through marriage. So God's design is for marriage, man and woman to be together. So that right priority is that you are trying to please God, honor God through that marriage relationship. That's it. So if you're the first thing you do is you're planning, you're desiring to be married one day and say, what's my goal in this? If my goal is simply not to be alone for the rest of my life, I understand that. I do. But the goal should be to honor God through the marriage relationship. So the second thing I want you to see is the right perception. Or I'm sorry, the right preparation. Right preparation. You... Let me tell you this. If you want to have the best, absolute best marriage that you can possibly have, number one, get saved. And number two, have a spouse who is saved. And work on that relationship with God. This preparation is when you're desiring to be in that lifelong love marriage relationship somewhere with someone, be the person that you think they deserve. The person that you're going to choose, choose a spouse, you, because honestly, most of us who love our spouses dearly think, oh, they deserve the world. I wish that I could give them everything, right? Be the person you believe they deserve. Make yourself that person. When I got saved and was going to church, I was in college right after I got saved, and I had this desire to be married one day. Not immediately, one day. And so I began praying, God, I, I want you to give me a wife one day. And I started preparing myself for this. And so I would read books about marriage relationship. I would go to conferences, men's conferences, where they're, remember Promise Keepers? I think they're still around. I would go to Promise Keepers to work on my relationship with God and hear from guys about how to have this magical marriage, right? I went to, golly, I can't even think of his name. There's a conference I went to, um, I think it's called Man in the Mirror thinking, how can I prepare myself? Look, I didn't have the best examples. My parents divorced when I was five. My dad married a second time, wasn't the best marriage, lasted for about five years. My mom married my stepdad. They stayed married for about 25 years till he died, but wasn't the best example of what a marriage should be. So I didn't have these role models. My grandparents, my, my dad's parents, met and married in about two weeks or something and stayed married for about, 50 some odd years until he passed away. Which is funny that um, how many of you know someone or are that person that met and married in a very short amount of time? Anyone? Okay, so Jeanette and I, we kind of had met, but we really didn't start talking or even a relationship. We dated and started dating in September. I proposed in December. I would have married her immediately, except she wanted a wedding and had time to plan for it, right? And then we got married the following July. But there's a lot of people who get meet and married. My grandparents were about two weeks. My parents were about uh, two months or something around that time frame. There was a time when people met and married quick and stayed married for a long time. Anyway, that preparation, preparing yourself for that eventual spouse is very important. I want to tell you there's a couple of things real quick that are not adequate preparation. These are not, young people, these are not adequate preparation for a marriage relationship. Are you ready for this? Number one is dating. I I know some people are like, wait, don't you have to date before you get married? Sure, but you don't have to date a lot of people. Because here's what happens in dating relationships quite often. 
you get into this relationship and you start having emotions, feelings for this person, I'll even say love. And then you break up for whatever reason because there's no commi real commitment then. You break up and you get hurt. And we know that when you get cut, whether it's in surgery or just a wound and it forms a scar, that that scar tissue is hardened, right? So if you get cut a second time in that same place, that scar tissue gets hardened even more. And the more times you get cut in that place, the more time that scar tissue reforms, the harder it gets. And when you go through these dating relationships and you keep breaking up and you place your trust, you place your confidence, your love in this person, and then you break up and it keeps forming this scar tissue and it gets harder and harder. And finally, when you find that person you think you want to marry and love, you've put up a wall. You have those scars and it's hard to completely allow them into your life, to trust them, to give yourself, to be vulnerable. That's what happens when you continually date thinking I need to build up work on relationships no ain't a whole lot of good comes from it the second thing that is not good preparation is cohabitation is that the right word when you live together that's a okay it, a lot of people will move in together thinking oh you know what trial basis it uh, almost always sets it up for failure when you say you know let's try this out well, you're saying that, well, maybe not. Moving in together is never, especially for Christians, never a good idea. It, am I saying that people who move in together before they get married don't last? I didn't say that. I'm saying it's not a good idea, especially for Christians. So, two things that are not adequate preparation for marriage. So, while we're talking about right preparation, there's three, I told you five Ps, three of those Ps go into the preparation. So the first P under preparation is this, the right people. Turn to Genesis chapter 24. We're going to read this story about Isaac and Rebekah, and we're going to read verse 24 through about 14. I'm going to read that whole thing, and we're going to look at three different things here. Chapter 24 in Genesis says, Abraham was now old, getting on in years, and the Lord had blessed him in everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household, who managed all he owned, Place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by the Lord God of heaven and God of earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you will go to my land and my family to take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant told, said to him, Suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me to this land. Shall I have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham answered him, Make sure that you don't take my son back there, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took my, me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you, and you can take a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath to me, but don't let my son go back there. So the servant placed his hand under his master Abraham's thigh and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. The servant took ten of his master's camels and departed with all kinds of master's goods in hand. Then he set out for Nahor's town in Aram, Naharaim. He made the camels kneel beside a well, a well of water outside the town at evening. This was the time when the women went out to draw water. And he says, Lord God of my master Abraham, he prayed, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. I am standing here at the spring where the daughters of men of the town are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I say, please lower your water jugs that I may drink, and the, who responds, drink and I'll water your camels also. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you, you have shown kindness to my master. So let's stop right there. The first thing I want you to see in chapter 24, verses 2 through 4 is this. When you're choosing that lifelong love marriage partner, choose from the right people. That sounds kind of shallow, doesn't it? It should sound shallow because it is, and it's, it's the right thing. Because, honestly, there's seven and a half, almost eight billion people on our planet. If you narrow that down, and look, Scripture says that believers should only be yoked together with other believers. And if you narrow it down, those seven and a half billion people, to just believers, now some people would put that figure at about a billion. I don't think so. I would narrow it down to fewer than that. Some people say around a hundred million believers in the world. 
that's still a lot of people, right? So you're thinking, okay, if, a roughly 50, if I'm a guy, roughly 52% of those people are women, well, okay, a lot of those are married already. You can't, unless you're Mormon, you can't have more than one. Um, so it starts narrowing down, doesn't it? So if you start listing that criteria, okay, I'd like someone who lives at least in the same area, Western Hemisphere, I guess, somebody who maybe lives in the same country as me, somebody maybe lives in the same state, it starts narrowing down. But really, if you think, wow, I've narrowed down the pool to about 50,000 people, that's still a lot of people. But here's the thing. When you choose from the right people, what I'm trying to say is choose from believers. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, we know this passage, right? For do not be mismatched, or King James, unequally yoked, with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteous or lawless? lawlessness or what fellowship does light have with darkness as a believer you are indwelt with the holy spirit of god you are that light you are that that christ indwells you we should not be unequally yoked whether it's in business or partnerships or whatever especially in marriage relationship with an unbeliever so really as you're setting criteria for who can i marry one day believer is the number one thing Someone who has placed their faith in Christ. Someone who has the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Y'all have seen the, the pyramid, right? I believe most of you probably know this illustration. You have a pyramid. At the top is God. Over here is the wife. Over here is the husband. Right? Now, the way I've seen the pyramid are equal, three equal sides. But really, the small is one. I don't do geometry, so I don't know the name of this, this triangle. But the bottom is narrower. Because honestly, as you grow closer to God, you grow closer together. The husband and the wife, as they grow closer to God, they clo grow closer together. But what if one of them is growing closer, but the other one isn't? You're actually getting further away from this person as you get closer to God. So God's desire is that these two believers grow closer to Him together in this relationship. That they, as they grow to Him, they grow together. I hope that makes sense. So God desires, wants you as a believer to be with someone else who is a believer. So he tells his servant, as you're going to look for a spouse for my son, I want you to go back to my hometown where I came from and choose from among my people. Now, if I did the math right, and I generally don't, Rebecca is Isaac's, like, first cousin once removed, right? I believe it's her granddad is Abraham's brother, which would make Isaac her cousin. They're royalty. It's okay. So he says, go back to my hometown, find someone from there. And the reason he does this is because they're living currently in Canaan. Canaan is a land of pagans. These people are not God worshipers in any way, shape, or form. Where he came from, these people have some semblance of worshiping the true God. Through oral traditions and stuff, that's one of the reasons God chose Abraham, because get, Abraham was already familiar with the God of the Bible. And his people are somewhat familiar with the God of the Bible. So he said, go back to my people, because they're at least familiar with the God we worship. Choose from there, because I don't want my son marrying one of these heathens. A good way, I mean, that's the truth, but they're heathens. Um, it's not nice to call people heathens, is it? Anyway, pagans, whatever. So he says, don't choose from these people. So for Christians, as a, a, a young adult, a young person is trying to find someone to marry, they should absolutely choose from the right people. The right people are people who have Christ, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them, someone who has made a profession of faith in Christ. The second thing I want you to see, the second P here, is the right place. Look in verse 4. In verse 4 he says, But go to my land and my people to take a wife for my son Isaac. And when we say the right place, what I'm talking about is where you go to look for this person. Now, of all the different dating apps and websites and stuff, some of them are just weird, right? And I'm not familiar with all of them, but not all of them are probably worth your time. Now, I, I think some of them are, are probably fantastic, and I've known people who have gone on to some of these, their Christian dating sites, and I think they're really well-meaning, and they ask a lot of in-depth spiritual questions about who you are, your relationship with God. And they find someone who, I guess, has answers. Some, I've never been on one of these sites, by the way. Um, 
so I'm not 100% familiar with them. But you go on and you put your profile and they match you through their computer system with someone else who is similar to you. That's amazing. I know people who have met their spouse through these sites and have incredible marriages. That God was able to use the site to put them together. That's great. But where should you go to find a Christian person? Well, most Christian people should be in the house of God on Sunday mornings, or if your church has Sunday night or Saturday night church, go there. So if you're looking for that person, one of the best places, probably the best place, is in church. Now, if you're going to a church, now I'm not advocating leaving Shady Grove, but if you're going to a church and there's not a lot of single people your age and you're looking, there are a lot of churches that have single ministries that do lots of activities together. I, I, my dad, when he was single and I was in high school, college age, was going to a church that had a big singles ministry. I, when I'm saying singles, I'm not talking like college age people. I'm talking about middle aged people. And these different churches would get together with singles activities and have um, picnics and get together so that these people who were seeking Christian relationships could find each other. And if you're a young person, you're looking for that re love relationship to be, for someone to marry, put yourself in situations and places where other Christian singles are going to be. They shouldn't be at the bar. They definitely ain't going to be at the Dallas Cowboys football game on Sunday morning. I'm just, no, I'm not playing. That's true. But they, the church is the absolute best place you can find them. And the last thing what you see is this, the right prayer. If you're not praying about that person, why wouldn't you be? When I got saved and I had this desire to be saved, to, to be married, and look, like I said, it wasn't like I wanted to be married right then. I was in college. I was like, I got to pay for college. I got to get through college. And then one day I hope God sends me a beautiful, godly wife. And I, honestly, two things I was specific about and I don't, I don't know if this is specific I said God I want her to be godly I want her to be beautiful I, I think I got both and then some when I was going to Castleberry Baptist Church through college I was involved in various ministries at the church I, I taught junior high I helped in the youth group at, on occasion I taught a college career class at one time and I would on occasion fill in the pastor's class which was a senior adult class and so a lot of these older ladies in the church got to know me and just would come up to me and they'd say, Jason, I just want you to know I'm praying that God sends you a godly, beautiful wife. And I tell you, if God listens to anybody's prayers, he listens to his older senior adult ladies. I'm telling you. So guys, if you want God to find you that godly, beautiful, perfect spouse, get some of these ladies to pray for you because he listens to them. And because a lot of them, they just pray all day long. And so God answered their prayers. He answered my prayers and gave me Jeanette. Pray about it. Jeanette and I, for years, when our kids were born, we began praying for their spouse. We don't know who, who he or she is, but we've been praying for them, God to send them someone that would compliment them, that would be the right person for them. And it's never too early and it's never too late to start praying for your kids and your grandkids that God would send that person and that God would make your child be that person for someone else. Because you know what? There's a parent out there praying for my kids to be the right person. Now, my kids are amazing. So, um, And they're cute. Look at them. Prayer. We see this, <laughs> this guy, this servant, he gets there to the well. And he prays, and I like what he says. He says, God, give me success today. He says, God, I need to find my master's son a wife. Give me success today. I mean, he, he put a time frame in there, didn't he? I like his time frame. Today, you know, I, I need to get home. Give me a success today. But he prays about this. And as believers in Christ, if you're that person who's looking for a spouse or you're the parent, grandparent of that person, we should definitely be on our knees in prayer for our child and for that person that's out there somewhere that they're going to marry one day. Guys, listen. Like I said, this marriage relationship is under attack in America. 
And it's, it's, it's so important that our young people know these biblical foundations for beginning this marriage relationship, how to look for the right person, where to look for the right person, to pray for the right person. Because they could go anywhere, and if they don't know what the Scripture teaches, they might just find the first person that makes them feel all bubbly inside. That's not going to last. But what will last is that foundation of Christ in the relationship. So guys, whether you're that person looking or you are, have that person in your life that's looking or will be, take these principles, these truths, share with them. Write these down, apply them. Because the marriage is under attack and what the church, what God needs, what America needs is marriages that are strong in Christ and that last. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief invitation. And honestly, when we say that the marriage relationship is a picture of the gospel, it's the bride of Christ, it's Christ being the, hus- the groom, the, the husband. And scripture tells us that Jesus loved his bride so much that he died for her. If you've never trusted Christ, put your faith in that atonement, that death. Today is the day. If you've never bowed your head, confessed your sins, asked Christ to save you, this morning, you're in this invitation. You can come down and talk to me, and I'll show you in Scripture what it means to be saved, or you can grab me at the back door. Or if you need to come down and you need to, you have those kids or you are that young person and you want to lay them at this altar and say, God, I surrender them to you and that person that is out there somewhere for them. God, I put them in your hands. If you need to come to this old-fashioned altar and, and commit your kids or their future spouses to Christ, by all means, don't, don't let anything stop you. Because our kids need our prayers. Father God, we come to you now and we commit this invitation to you this time of of decision whether it's salvation or commitment to pray for or to commit ourselves to looking for that person in a way that honors you to have a relationship that glorifies you god we ask for your spirit to move in our hearts right now that you'd bless this time in jesus name remain seated if you would turn in your hymnals to number 479 softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling calling for you and for me Sing on the Thank you for your attentiveness this morning, and I pray that you were blessed. And um, deacons meeting, following service, adult one. And don't forget, kids choir tonight, children's choir. And then we we had to skip um, Wednesday night activities this week because of inclement weather. But we should be back in full force this week because I don't think there's another snow event, ice event this week, I hope. Uh, So you almost look disappointed. Oh, okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, have a, it looks like a beautiful day out there. So y'all have a beautiful, wonderful, blessed day. And uh, I will see you either Wednesday or next Sunday. 
I keep thinking there's something I'm forgetting to announce, but I'll remember as soon as I open the doors back there. Let's stand and end again with a word of praise. Praise him, praise him. Number 12, just the first verse. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing for earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor into his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent praise. Praise Him, praise Him. 